welcome to our session on uh, e shikshana program so this is professor umar rao from rv college of engineering bringing you the lectures on uh, electrical power quality so this is my seventh talk and in the last two talks we saw a number of voltage uh, disturbances how to define them qualitatively quantitatively how to make a comparison and so on so in this session we will discuss some terms which are commonly used with power quality now before i go to the terms let's see uh, we have discussed so many things right so we will just summarize that and see if as an auditor or as a person affected by power quality problems how do i make a cost analysis of the um, disturbance of the disturbance okay so first we have the power quality disturbances so all the classes which we have uh, studied right i hope i hope you all remember and i don't have to uh, again go through all of them so do they affect the equipment yes they affect the equipment equipment may malfunction equipment may break down or overheating you have to do derating so in different ways they affect the equipment do they affect the process definitely if the equipment gets affected automatically the process is also affected the process is also affected does it affect productivity of course your my equipment process are affected definitely i'll have to shut down the equipment productive productivity will come down we will have huge downtime costs we'll have huge downtime costs right so you see because of power quality disturbances equipment processes and productivity all are affected all are affected we have seen all this i'm just only summarizing so what happens to equipment damage malfunction okay and decreased operating time that means life expectancy is reduced life expectancy is reduced if you operate an equipment for a long time under harmonics the equipment life will be reduced or if it is unbalanced for a short time it's okay for a long time if you operate a motor in with unbalanced voltage definitely the motor will suffer okay so the equipment either can have a damage or a malfunction or their life expectancy can be reduced what we mean is it may not you may not see the damage obviously but in the life of the equipment will definitely reduce and with a process what can happen either you have a partial loss of the process or a total shutdown i can't operate only okay that is another thing which can happen so it could be a partial loss or a total loss then productivity you can have long term uh, productivity poor productivity or low product quality i told you yesterday silicon wafers even if there is a slight deviation in the quality of voltage the wafer quality you get is not good okay so you you will end up with very poor quality products or you can always have a long term productivity issue and when you want to calculate the damage or the cost of power quality disturbances all these have to be taken into account some of them may, may not be very obvious or measurable for example the life ex expectancy reduction how will you measure it how can i tell this is a motor because it's operated under unbalance its life is reduced by 10% you can't very difficult to quantify however it is a cost why a cost because you have to invest on a new motor early because the old motor doesn't work its life expectancy has come down so an early investment always is equivalent to a cost so remember whenever we defer investments whenever we have solutions which can defer investments they are always um, attractive they are always have to be preferred because a deferred investment means you get more value for your money if you have to invest earlier your money value comes down what you use okay so when you want to make a cost analysis we are not going into details of it that is outside the scope but 
as having undergone a course in power quality i wanted you to know how how is the cost pin that how do you pin the cost of power quality disturbances in a system so all these have to be considered some may be measurable some may not be measurable so you may use some heuristic or thumb rules you have to do it now the same thing so what are all the uh, categories in which you can do you can just make a table and put into different categories process interruption my motor drive has not operated for 10 minutes so what is the cost due to that my process has been interrupted this motor will be running some process now so that has been interrupted so what is the cost of that there is a slowdown in my process so how do i pin the cost of that equipment damage partial complete how do i take the cost of that decreased operating time that is life life expectancy of the equipment is decreased how do you pin a cost on that not very easy energy efficiency obviously when the efficiency is reduced efficiency is reduced losses are more that means you will be paying more electricity uh, tariffs you will be drawing more energy so how do i calculate that cost low quality products very difficult to quantify this no very difficult to measure how can you tell if the quality reduces by 10% what is the loss not very easy huh? so why i am telling you all this is from a managerial perspective it is not very easy to um, define what are the issues with power quality decreased work productivity okay the motor is shut down the whole process is shut down i have 10 people working on the shop floor they are free but they are being paid because it's not their fault they are not on strike or something right so the process itself has stopped so they don't have any work obviously this means a wasteful expenditure so because of work productivity reduced and you will have other so many indirect costs repair maintenance because of poor quality and so on so all these categories have to be analyzed before you arrive at the cost of power quality disturbances at a particular premise as domestic consumers we do not face too many issues but industries definitely yes because industries have sensitive equipment and imagine a 5000 hp motor even if there is a 1% reduction in efficiency the energy loss would be huge isn't it so i have to pay attention to that whereas in my in my house if my fan efficiency reduces motor efficiency reduces by 1% i don't even it may not even be perceptible in my energy bill whereas for large drives it will be okay so industries have to be very very cautious about uh, these things and this is how the costs are evaluated so the percentage share of pq disturbances this is in europe this is just to give you an idea now that you know all the different types of power quality disturbances how frequently do they occur right so sags voltage sags i told you in europe they use the word dip they are the most frequent and they occur 24% of the power quality disturbances are due to voltage sags short interruptions that means uh, an interruption for less than a minute is about 19% long interruptions for more than a minute power loss is about 13% harmonics contribute to about 5% of the problem transients and surges are on 28% and other unaccountable problems you can't i told you it's sometimes very difficult to pinpoint you just put it under others the classification will be in others it's about 11% other problems is about 11% now this is this is not sacrosanct it will depend on the grid it will depend on the weather condition so in in geographical locations where lightning and all that thunderstorms are all very frequent the transients and surges may be more okay the sag may be less because they may have very good uh, uh, redundancy and uh, you know backups to prevent sags so this this cannot be generalized this is just only indicated okay this is only indicated now what are the responsibilities in all this we will just have a brief discussion as i said i am putting all this for completeness of whatever you have studied since this is the first module we are doing introduction i want you to be very clear about what it is so who are the three players in the power market one is the customer obviously or the consumer and the device manufacturers who give you equipment is is a tv tv manufacturer a part of my network definitely i am using the product 
and running the product with, with the voltage which I'm getting. Okay, so all your device manufacturers, they're all, they are also a part of the ecosystem of the power industry and obviously the network operators, that is the utilities, private or public, whatever it is, private or government work, right? So now let us see from a power quality perspective, I'm not talking of any other perspective, what is the role and what are the interactions? First, the customers they ask for their specific requirements to the device manufacturer. So the, the device manufacturer has to do something in the design process, you know, in the design process. The first step is they have to do something called as an empathy. That means they have to take a survey. I already have TVs. No, now fantastic TVs you have in the market. Supposing somebody wants to come up with a new TV, what new feature has to be added? What is it that the customer wants? So the customer puts forth their specific requirement to the device manufacturer. Look, I want this. I want a TV which, which is not very susceptible to flicker. Okay. I want a TV which can be stable under, you know, the sags and so on. So that is the customer requirement. So customers may not even be able to directly give it. Sometimes the manufacturer has to do a survey prepare a questionnaire and then gather the questionnaire and then gather the information from the customer. And what is the re responsibility of the uh, device manufacturer? They have to deliver the devices as per applicable standard recommendations. Okay, so you have standards. See, there are other players also here. There are other players also here. Right, you have the regulatory bodies, you have the lawmakers, everything. We are talking of the three main stakeholders. Next, coming to the network operators, the customers will put forth their problems to the network operators. Look, I'm having frequent shedding. Very frequently, my motor is stalling because of low voltage. What is it? So they give complaints to the network operators. And it is the responsibility of the network operator, which is also we call as the utility, to maintain the power quality at the consumer premises. In this context, when we talk of power quality, we mean voltage quality. So they must give the voltage at the required, um, at the specified magnitude and uh, as nearly sinusoidal as possible without any frequency deviations. Okay. Then, Network operators and device manufacturers. So they, they both of them, they should adhere to all the standards and regulations. They cannot violate it. So the operators and the device manufacturers operate under some standards set by organizations, authorized organizations like IEEE, IEC. They have to meet it. Okay. So this slide more or less tells you the three major stakeholders, how they interact with respect to power quality aspects in the system. So now let's come to some terms and definitions, apart from what you have already seen. Okay, we have, we have defined power quality disturbances. Here we will be discussing some terms which are associated with power quality disturbances. The first is active filter. So a filter is anything which, you know, uh, compensates for the harmonics in the system. So you know that tuned filters, tuned circuits like an RLC circuit, where you have a fixed resonant frequency. So if you have a tuned circuit, this will offer a low impedance path to a particular frequency. So if I have a motor, okay, I can provide, I can provide a harmonic filter across it for a third harmonic, a fifth harmonic, because this motor is driven by uh, a power electronic converter, I can do it. So those are called as passive filters. Okay, they are called as passive filters. So these passive filters have bulky you know, inductors, capacitors, and they cannot do too many things. They cannot, for example, you know, uh, compensate for the power factor, balance, and then uh, compensate for harmonics, multiple things they can't do. So in the past decade, 
a lot of work has gone into designing and manufacturing active filters. So active filters use power electronic devices for mitigating the harmonic distortion. So again, the power electronic devices like converters, they are both the source of the problem and also solution of the problem, right? First of all, I have harmonics mainly because of the power electronic devices today in the modern industry. And using them only, I provide a solution. That's it. So active filters are power electronic circuits designed to eliminate certain harmonic distortion. So you can do it by suitably controlling the switches, the power electronic switches. Next, common mode voltage is the noise voltage that appears equally from current carrying conductor to ground. That's called as a common mode voltage. Coupling. So we all know about mutual coupling. Okay, so one circuit is coupled to the other circuit. So in this context, coupling is a circuit element or a group of elements or a network that may be considered common to the input mesh and the output mesh through some energy transfer. Energy transfer always happens when there is coupling. If there is no energy transfer, coupling is, it has no meaning at all. And this energy transfer may hinder my objectives. So this coupling need not be only between two power circuits. It could be between a power circuit and a communication equipment a power equipment and a communication equipment. There you can have coupling. Okay. So these couplings, sometimes you can notice them, you can uh, pinpoint, sometimes you can't. They will, they will cause unnecessary interference. They'll cause unnecessary interference. Next, you have crest factor. It's a way we all know. You have studied in basic and electrical engineering. It is the ratio of the peak value to the RMS value. Peak value to the RMS value. So for a pure sinusoid, the crest factor is 1.414. You all derived this in the first year engineering. So this crest factor is important in the context of harmonics. If you recollect in the previous lecture, I showed you some how a converter, the current, how it draws a distorted current. So the crest factor is directly an indication of how high the current or voltage can jump with respect to the average RMS value. So crest factor is one important parameter uh, in uh, characterizing harmonics. Then critical load. What? I have so many loads on the system. So what do I deem as critical? What do I deem as critical? So the loads whose failure or damage can lead to a huge process loss or huge damage to property or can become hazardous to the health of the operators itself. If your grounding is improper, it can even be fatal to the operator at times. Clear? So critical loads are those loads whose failure produces disastrous results. Not all loads are critical in the system. Not all loads in a facility like an industry are critical. There are some loads in an industry which may fail. For example, the manager or the CEO's AC doesn't work. Nothing will happen. It's not a critical load. Whereas the main motor drive in the printing press that fails, it's critical. Because with failure of that drive, the whole process comes to a stop. The productivity will be stopped. There'll be a huge financial loss. So whenever we make an assessment of power quality uh, disturbance, we have to identify what are the critical faults and ensure that you know the power quality disturbances, they are mitigated for those critical loads. Your computers are all critical. Imagine a control center. Everything is controlled by the computer and that computer is a very sensitive load. So I cannot operate it directly from the grid. I have to have a dedicated UPS because if the computer fails, my entire control will fail. If the PLCs, PLCs are digital logic circuits. So they're also very prone to, very sensitive to voltage deviations. 
So all these critical loads, I must ensure that, you know, they are immune, they're protected against the power quality disturbances. Clear? Now, distributed generation, the name itself tells you what it is. In our conventional system, the generations are generators are located at some remote end, wherever there is a source for the generation, maybe coal or maybe water, whatever it is. So with the entry of renewables, now I can generate at different pockets. So, and I generate at low voltage. Earlier, it was very clearly demarcated. Generation, transmission, distribution. Now distribution sector has generation. Houses have solar rooftop. Academic institutions have, uh, you know, so much of solar PV installed. So generation has become distributed. Generally, when we talk of distributed generation, they're smaller size, less than 10 megawatts in size. And they are mostly connected to the distribution system rather than, than in the transmission system. So in our original grid, what we do, we generate, step up and connect it to the transmission. Now I have the generation at the distribution, at the distribution, clear? Yeah. So this distributed generation has changed the scenario of the power system totally, entirely changed. Your frequency control, your active power control, the erratic nature of the distributed generation, all these have drastically uh, uh, changed the profile of operation and control of the power system itself. The other jargon used is dropout, which is a loss of equipment operation due to noise, sag, or interruption. The name tells, the equipment drops out. It's no longer in service because of some power quality disturbance. The dropout voltage, what is it? Name again tells you. The voltage at which the device will be de-energized. For example, you have a relay. Threshold, what is the threshold below which it will not work? I have a motor. What is the lowest voltage at which it will work, below which it will not work? That is the dropout voltage. The voltage at which a device will release to its de-energized position. That means it will drop out. Okay. Or a voltage at which a device fails to operate. Fast tripping. This refers to, you know, providing with a fast circuit breaker, with a line reclosure, with a reclosure facility, instead of having a fuse which will blow off. So fuse blows off means it's a problem because you may have to go and replace it manually. There is no way a blown out fuse will, uh, you know, uh, replace itself. There is no way. Okay. Whereas a circuit breaker can be made to reclose because you have contacts. You can design the circuit breaker. It will open. And then you can design it to close after a specified time and then open again. All that can be done. So this fast tripping of breakers will save fuse. Okay. So it is very good for clearing transient faults without a sustained interruption. Because transient faults we saw no, yes, in, in, some le in the previous lecture, they die down sometimes in nanosecond and microsecond. So if a fuse blows off, gone. Somebody has to go and replace the fuse unnecessary service interruption you have. Instead, if I have a fast reclosing breaker, the breaker will open, quickly reclose. By then the transient fault would have died down and the service will resume. So your interruption can be reduced. The interruption can be reduced. Okay. But however, even this momentary, it will take some time for the breaker to open and reclose. Eight cycles, 10 cycles. There are many products. But even to do this, even to do this, this may also affect the industry. Some industry equipment may be so sensitive, even this instantaneous or very short momentary interruption also, they cannot withstand. Then you have no choice but to have a dedicated service supply for your equipment. Then ground, another very commonly used uh, jargon, it's a connection, could be intentional or accidental, where an electric circuit or electrical equipment is connected to the earth or some other conducting body which serves as the earth. So the earth is considered to be of uniform potential. 
it is considered to be of uniform potential so if you don't do proper grounding then it can be very dangerous so you all seen in our domestic we have a three pin plug so you have a line a neutral and a ground so your equipment body will be connected to the ground point so if you by chance the body gets short circuited for some internally something happens so if you touch it right your body and the grounding wire they will be in parallel and obviously the grounding wire is a copper wire so it has very low resistance so the current will not flow through your body instead it will flow through the grounding wire so very safe and as i told you and have repeatedly told a lot of power quality disturbances arise because of improper grounding a ground loop it's a potentially hazardous loop formed when two or more points in an electrical system that are nominally at ground potential are connected by a conducting path which is not at ground potential okay that means it's like a short shorting two points so that can be very dangerous eye landing eye landing is used especially with distributed generation where the distributed generation is isolated from uh, the load which it is serving so eye landing refers to a condition condition in which distributed generation is isolated on a portion of the load served by the utility power system eye landing is done sometimes to protect the uh, operating uh, personnel for working with the distributed generation it is usually an undesirable situation however you can have an intentional eye landing to protect the grid for example let us say i have an interconnected grid and there is a fault etc now what i can do i can isolate a part of the grid eye land remove it from the rest of the grid and see that it operates independently okay so it can be done intentionally to improve the reliability of the system so in power system operation eye landing is one major aspect one emergency control measure we take to prevent a total blackout of the grid and you know modern grids are huge right massive in size so therefore if having a total blackout the downtime cost you can't even imagine so at such times eye landing can help to keep a part of the grid intact so it can reduce your blackout downtime costs a linear load is a device or a load which essentially presents a constant impedance to the power source throughout the cycle of the applied voltage a non linear is something which doesn't do it right passive filter i told you it's a combination of inductors capacitors and resistors to eliminate one or more frequencies whereas an active filter you can design to eliminate all the frequencies at one time you can't do that with a passive filter so you need one filter for third harmonic one filter for fifth harmonic and maybe one high pass filter and so on reclosing i have used this word repeatedly is where a breaker closes after a short time after opening so again there are standards possibly you have studied it in your protection for how long it should be open when should it close how many times it should be closed so there are different standards based on which the breakers operate so this can vastly improve the reliability and reduce the interruption time recovery time is the time required for the output voltage or current to come back to its normal value after a power quality disturbance so i have a sag so how much time does it take to recover for the for the system to recover this is very dicey you know very difficult i'll tell you why let us say i have a sag okay and uh, the sag voltage itself recovers the voltage recovers um, say after about uh, uh, you know it's less than 1 minute so say after about 50 seconds so you know sag durations last for less than a minute so after 50 seconds the voltage recovers so the sag duration the recovery time is 50 seconds that's all but but when i calculate the cost see how dicey this recovery time is 
because of this 50 second sag my process stopped okay my process stopped my drives everything i had to switch off everything now to bring back the entire process to original condition to bring back the entire process to original condition i need 4 hours i need 4 hours because it's not easy you know so maybe because of your process you are using some mold plastic liquid plastic they have all solidified you have to throw it discard it something so now what is the recovery time of the power quality disturbance is it 50 seconds which was the time taken for the voltage to recover but from your industry perspective it is 4 hours because your entire industry process got stopped for 4 hours right so it is not enough for us when we do a cost analysis just to look at how how much time the power quality disturbance lasted hmm? then recovery voltage is the voltage that across occurs across the terminals after the uh, circuit interrupting process shield is normally applied to instrumentation cables and it refers to a conductive sheet a metallic sheet over the insulation for the purpose of providing a means to reduce coupling between the conductors so i provide i we saw coupling can cause interference so so shielded and other conductors that may be susceptible to or which may be generating unwanted electrostatic or, or electromagnetic fields so i provide a conductor so that this field of the cables instrumentation cables do not interfere with others then sympathetic tripping when a circuit breaker on an unfaulted feeder section trips unnecessarily yesterday you remember when i showed voltage voltage sag i showed you three parallel feeders right where because of a fault in one feeder the other feeder voltage is also get affected so if those feeders get tripped unnecessarily then that's called as a sympathetic tripping sympathy somebody else has a problem so i also cry okay the fault lies elsewhere and i am also tripped sympathetic tripping can occur sometimes due to improper protection design okay improper protection design or you know when you have very overly sensitive earth relays then also sympathetic tripping can happen because some amount of fault will always lead to some leakage earth currents and if you if it trips then unnecessarily the equipment is getting tripped so you see when it comes to protection over sensitive protection is also not good because then your equipment keeps getting tripped for every small reason okay so sympathetic tripping is that and uh, but and if you don't plan your design properly your directional relays etc properly then the selectivity is lost the selectivity is lost and relays may trip for faults at some other locations that's called a selectivity in protection so selectivity and sensitivity of the protective equipment are the two main causes for sympathetic tripping thank you so uh, in this class we saw about the various terms that are commonly used in uh, power quality uh, disturbances and uh, See you again in the next class.